He has made helping those in need around the globe his life's work. Now, after more than four decades with the humanitarian aid organization World Vision, Dave Toyson is retiring. Joining us now to reflect on his time trying to fix a frequently soul-crushing world, here is Dave Toyson, the outgoing president and CEO of World Vision Canada, and it's always great to have you here at TVO, Dave. Great. Thank you, Steve. We Thank will you. get to the soul-destroying part of our discussion in just a little bit, but I want to know what 42 years ago brought you to World Vision in the first place. Well, I, I wish it was something, you know, really high calling or whatever, but actually I needed a summer job. I was in <laughs> graduate school and I'd been working with a professor on some communications project, television stuff, uh, film stuff rather, and I, he went off on sabbatical and I had no job. And just before he left, World Vision called him. He'd had some consulting, I think, a bit with them. They were looking for somebody to do radio spots. Uh, they were producing radio spots. And I had no experience in radio. And, uh, but before he left, he said, ah, give Dave a shot. He's pretty quick and he can write. Good uh, voice. <laughs> so that was it. <laughs> And That's a very disappointing story, Dave. <laughs> I, I, I truly thought you were going to tell me, well, I was on Mount Sinai one day, and I went to the top, and I saw God, and he told nothing like that. No, but what did happen, I mean, within, I would say, five or six weeks, I knew, like, this is what I want to be part of. And, and I did, certainly, I've, I've had a sense of calling ever since, that this was the, the space I was supposed to be in. But I just, it didn't start out that way. And that's, oftentimes, life is like that, too. We're going to show a series of pictures now because you have literally been all over the world helping those who are in the most desperate of conditions. Sheldon, if we can, let's start to bring these up. There we go. Dave, look at the monitor over my shoulder there. This, I guess, is the late 1970s. You look a little bit different. Where, <laughs> yes. where are we here? Well, I'm struggling to, I think it's Indonesia. Uh, I'm not positive. It's definitely Asia. Okay. And what I was doing, I was setting up a, uh, a photographer and a writer in each of our offices because we wanted to move towards people locally telling their own story rather than us coming there and going back. There needed to be a combination of, that's what I was up to. Gotcha. Here's the next picture. This one in, this is either Afghanistan or Iran. Yeah, it's uh, early, Afghanistan, I it think. It is Afghanistan. Yeah. Okay, early was, 2000s. Yeah, early 2000s, uh, just visiting families. It was cold and just a tremendously hard time for people. Indeed. You really sense that. Indeed. Here's uh, Myanmar. After yeah, that's after Cyclone Nargis, mm -hmm. and just meeting with, these were children, family members as well, who had been affected by the cyclone, and we were doing relief work, and I'm, I'm always trying to interact with the local people, partly because I want them to know that I care, but I'm also, I'm always learning when you do that. Next picture is Indonesia. Yeah, this that's is just a few years ago. Yeah, this is actually, Tom Cochran's with me on that one, actually. Oh, yeah, from Red Rider, there he yep. is. And uh, we were, once again, looking at issues around the health and nutrition of children and the real concern about the early years of their life. I'm not sure there's a more desperate place on earth, although you wouldn't think so from this picture, than Sudan. This is you, 2006 in Sudan. Yes, this was in one of the, at that time, many refugee camps, still many today, and, but they were making things and selling things, showing that they could be productive even in the environment of, of a refugee, refugee camp. If there's one picture that shows that you've seen the world, this is the one. <laughs> What's all that? Well, I have a habit of taking a notebook with me to each country that I go to to take notes. Some cases I'll double them up as well. So that's, I think that's most of my notebooks during my 18 years as president. Do you have any idea how many countries you've been to? No. This <laughs> may be something in retirement. I'll sit down, pull out my passports, and see if I can figure it out. Got to be, a, I mean, it's a few dozen anyway, oh, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Easily a few dozen. Yeah. How many different diseases have you contracted in your work? <laughs> the only one that I'm aware of, and this is kind of embarrassing, I got malaria about two years ago. Uh, it was Where? In, in West Africa. And I got caught, I, I confess I haven't been faithful in always taking all the you know, the, the booster the, shots and so on. Yeah, well, and, and you, just taking the tablets particularly mm. is when you when you travel as much as I do, I just don't like to do that. But anyway, it was it was a story of ignorance <laughs> and neglect on my part. And I paid the price. You turn it into something positive, though. I do recall reading on your website, yeah. you know, I got malaria, but I can get over it. These people get That's it all right. the time and it's not so easy for them to get over and it. And the fact that they're getting many are getting malaria on a regular basis. And it's just, it just slows you down so much. Hmm. Rwanda, after the 94 genocide, mm. you're there, you're traveling to Zaire, you're on the border. 
Let's bring up this picture here. Here is a picture of a boy named, is it Gasor? Is that how he says his Gasori, name? Yeah. Gasori, yeah. Gasori. He was four years old. How did you meet him? Well, we, I was at the end of my time. This is in the old Zaire, and the, and the refugees, these are people who had fled uh, Rwanda thinking there would be retribution against them. And it, it was a kind of a hell on earth place. We were doing relief work and it was sort of my last day and I wanted to go to one other major camp that had something almost close to 100,000 people in it, I think. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to go and we were driving down the road and all of a sudden it, he looked like, he was so malnourished, he looked like E.T. from the movie. He was just skin and bones. Mm -hmm. And he was just walking, plodding along the road. We stopped uh, and our translator was with us uh, and he got out because I thought we would scare him because uh, we were all, I guess, mostly white people. And so uh, he got out and started, and we discovered this little boy, his parents had died. He wasn't sure when. He hadn't had anything to eat for three days, I think he said. Mm -hmm. And he'd had no water for at least a day. All I had in the car was a half a Coke can. I didn't remember he almost ate the thing. Mm -hmm. he, he was so thirsty. We took him back. Uh, got him some food, looked after him, and then we had a group of other children that we had collected at World Vision that were just children that came out of sort of nowhere. And uh, I was able to see him a couple of times, and he was kind of a moment, a very precise moment where you're able to do something very specific, which we all love, something very tangible, and you feel like you're making a difference in the middle, in the middle of something that was just unthinkable. And that location, at the beginning days, we were feeding people on one plot of the land, and then adjacent to us, we had 160 dead bodies lying in the sun, and we couldn't get them buried. So you're, you're providing food here and dead people laying over here from cholera, all sorts of just untreated disease of one kind or another. And so Gasori was a, a positive experience for me and really meant a lot. Now, unfortunately, there's a bit of a sad thing to this because eventually, the children we had were joined with other children and an organization was looking after orphans specifically and there was a lot of military conflict going on in that area and probably about a year and a half or two years later it was overrun huge amount of killing and I've lost Kasori I can't find him. You don't know where he is We've, now. I've had staff looking for him we don't know I just don't know if he's alive or not I choose to believe that I, I hope he is. But you met him more than 20 years ago and stayed in touch with him until what just a couple of years ago? Oh, no, no, Th this happened. This happened within two years of oh, the I location. See. He I was see. still okay. just a little boy. Ah, okay. And this tr camp was overrun, and the children just <laughs> ran for their lives, I'm sure. Hmm. As you have tried to do what you have done over the years, I mean, you do it through a faith-based organization. There mm -hmm. are other organizations who try to do what you do, and they're not based in religion at all. Mm -hmm. Is there a difference in how each different kind of organization would approach this work? Well, I, yes, I think there are some differences. I, however, I'd want to say right from the beginning, you know, there, there's a good way to get an education. There's a, a good way in which health is delivered to a community. And there's, at that level, at the technical level, I don't know that there's much difference. But I think when you're coming from faith-based, your motivation's a, a bit different because it's an expression of your faith. Uh, I think that perhaps, I, I would hope, I want to say this very carefully, I would hope because from my perspective, a real Christian is someone whose priority is to express love. Not, I'm not talking, I'm talking about the kind of love where you're wishing the best for the other person. Once again, I don't think Christianity owns that space, but certainly as a Christian organization, we sure do our best to try to practice that in how we behave with each other as well as how we behave with the children and families that we're seeking to help. Now, whether that makes us any different or not, I can't be the judge of that. I think uh, the, the proof is in the way we behave and the way we respond. Uh, but I think, and I think the other, probably the other uniqueness is that we're looking at the evil, the difficulty f through a lens where we believe there's, there's a God who created the world, you know, created human beings in, in God's image, and that everybody has value. I think that shapes your, your, my understanding of people and I think that part of it is very important in the way we work. Well, that gets to the soul-destroying reference I made in the introduction, which is through the course of your work, you have come into contact with probably more death, destruction, misery, hopelessness, fear, anger, frustration than maybe anybody I've ever met in my life. 
and I need to know how you just haven't lost all faith. Mm. Well, I mean, I, I confess I get angry and upset. Uh, and, prob and one recent example maybe illustrates this. I was in uh, South Sudan where there's recently been a huge blow up of conflict and I was in a place called Malakel, 100,000 people. The, the city's just been flattened. Uh, everything was destroyed. The hospitals, the schools, the churches, the mo they were just, just destroyed. And, you, and, I was, and they were all crammed together like they didn't even know how many, 15, 20,000 people. I was with a UN convoy, you know, an orphan, a tent of orphans, another couple of tents of elderly people interviewing a mother who is all shot up. She's got her leg in a cast. Her husband's been killed. Three of her daughters have been kidnapped. It's a nightmare, mm. just a nightmare. And it was a Sunday morning, and I was pretty bent out of shape. And as we were walking out, I caught some sound, some music. And I looked up, and in the distance was a group of, I think a lot of these people were Christian people. They were standing up, singing, praising God on a Sunday morning in the middle of hell on earth. <laughs> and I think it's those things that are, I guess if you're looking, it somehow means something to me that we're not adrift, that this isn't going to go on forever. There's still hope. And the people sometimes who suffer the most seem to be almost more able to find hope sometimes than those of us who have so much more, and we're there to help. Okay, but before you saw that scene that gave you hope, was there a moment where you... Oh, I mean, I absolutely. Just, I just imagine you oh. at some point looking up to the heavens and shaking your fist yeah. and saying, God, what are you yeah. thinking? Yeah. Have I, you had one of those kind of oh, moments? Oh, absolutely. I, I go through it periodically. And I just kind of have to circle back and say, I'm not getting the answer I want for this, that's for sure. But I'm just reminded that I think the basic truth of the Christian faith is that Christianity isn't the kind of deal where if you join, life's going to be easier for you. In many cases, life might be harder. But the idea behind it is, is that God will be present. And sometimes we don't feel that, but it doesn't mean God's not present. And then the other thing for me is that well, I, I'm not too surprised about suffering when, when Jesus and Christians see as God's Son is allowed to die on the cross, one of the most horrible deaths you could imagine. The other thing that just hit me the other day, what's the other thing that happens? The birth of the baby Jesus, Herod goes in and slaughters every child under the age of two or three, every male child to try to be sure he gets rid of this quote Messiah. I mean, this is a faith in which there's been a lot of violence for, in order for you to, to live and to believe. And so I, I'm not surprised at some level. The other thing I think is to, we have to be careful. When we get all churned up about this stuff, how does that really help the people who are suffering? If I'm going to spend all my time being angry at God or angry at something, how does that help a little child who hasn't had food for three days? Well, it doesn't, but it might make you second guess your own faith. Has that ever happened? Yeah. I, yeah, I, I always feel, I'm <laughs> trying not to exaggerate, but I always feel like I'm kind of one step away from the ditch, you know, for, of one distraction or the other. And so uh, my experience is you kind of have to have a reaffirmation of faith pretty regularly in your life, at least for me, because I, I'm a person who feels very intensely the brokenness of our world, and it's a heartbreak. It's a heartbreak over and over again, and yet, when you look out there, you see signs of hope. You see people who don't give up. You see people who have moved from A to B. And that just, that empowers me. And uh, for me, that's able to keep me going. But is it full of mystery at times? Absolutely. Is it, and, and I, one of the reasons I like the book of Psalms in the Old Testament because it's a book about treating God like a person rather than some distant power, raging. You know, the, the raging in there, the anger as a result of the injustice that the writer is experiencing is, is palpable. And yet, there never is a sense in the, in the book of Psalms that somehow you can't do that. It's acceptable to do that. That's about a real relationship. Hmm. And 
once again, I'm encouraged by that. What, what, just talking about the situation in, uh, in the Congo, it was a terrible time, and there's a book in the Old Testament called Lamentations. It's one of the worst books to ever read in the Bible. It's just, it's the story of the destruction of, of Israel. And every, you know, the raping of the children, the uh, killing of the children, the raping of the daughters, selling them into slavery, it goes on and on. But in the middle of that book, there's a, there's a Christian hymn that says, Great is thy faithfulness. And great in thy faithfulness is in one little chapter in the middle of Lamentations, which is one of the most depressing books in the entire Bible. And so even in the literature, you see this incredible twisting and turning over the evil of the earth and a God who's to be caring and loving and care for us. So in spite of all the misery you have seen over the years, what would you say is your collective central accomplishment, having spent more than four decades trying to repair this world? I have been blessed to work with some incredible people. I've been blessed to see the stories, to experience the stories of people who have so little and yet believe and hope so much and to be able to see some progress. When I started, what, in 1973, I think we talked about 40 to 45,000 children dying every day from hunger and preventable diseases. Today, what, 40 some years later, with another billion population addition, we're down now, some debate about the number, 17,000, 16,000 children a day. So it may be slow, it may be bumpy, but we're going in the right direction. Progress. That's progress. Is there one thing you didn't get done that you wish you had got done? Oh, good question. Uh, I, I just, I think, I wish in some ways I had thought bigger. <laughs> I thought that, that I had been willing to take on even, take on some of the even bigger challenges that, that maybe I, more than I could have. I don't know. There's a bigger challenge than, than housing I, the homeless and feeding it, the hungry? Being, and, I don't know, being, being more aggressive about some things. Uh, maybe that. But most of all, I just feel blessed. And, I'm, and as I say, I'm, I'm retiring, but I'm not going out of the cause. I mean, the cause of children will be with me. I'm, I'm hoping there'll be certainly something I can do that'll continue to be helpful to World Vision. So um, I'm not retiring from this cause. Well, that was going to be my next question, which is you're retiring from this job. Yeah. But I, I presume you're going to take a bit of time to figure out what comes next. Yep. Going to take some time off. I want to, yeah, want to do, I want to do some sort of a directed spiritual retreat, try to get, kind of think deeper. Where will you do that? Uh, probably here in Canada somewhere, find a retreat area, um, but somewhere, and I need a, probably need a spiritual director to help me do that, so I'm going to do that. When's your last day on the job? Well, I'm not sure yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure. My successor will be named shortly, um, so, and, and just a, it depends on who the person is and what kind of transition they would like with me uh, before I walk out the door. Because you're, you're at what, middle 60s, I'm presuming? And yes. You don't seem to me to be the kind of guy who's just going to kick his feet up on the Barca lounger oh, and watch no. TV for the rest of your days. No, no. I do. I got some grandchildren. Uh, we'll, we want to spend some more time with them. A little bit of travel. My wife has been extremely long-suffering and <laughs> loving in the midst of all of this. So I want to do that. Uh, but most of all, I just want to get a sense of what, how can I add value with the, the, the remaining years of my life? What does that look like? And uh, Because I don't, I don't think... As a person, and there's so much evidence that says you're, it's really good to keep your hand in some things, to be doing something. As a Christian, I feel that particularly strongly as well. You never kind of retire from life. Mm -hmm. There's so much opportunity uh, to make a difference in our world. So that'll be my focus. Mm -hmm. You're always so, in spite of it all, cheery when you come in here. <laughs> and I'd love to be with you at one of those moments when you're shaking your fist at God and asking, yeah. what in heaven's name is going on, Father? <laughs> maybe, maybe I'll have the chance to see one of those moments one of these days. Yeah, we, we need to do a trip. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I guess. Dave, it's uh, not only good of you to come in today and share your <clears throat> life story with us, but you've uh, graced our studio so many times over the years. And uh, I've always enjoyed these conversations. Thanks so much again. Thank you, Steve, for your great questions. I'm so grateful. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at tvo.org.